So here we are ready to talk about object-oriented programming, or OOP for short. You'd be forgiven for wondering what all the fuss is about, or if you're confused by the strange sounding title, you know, objects, where are these objects? How do they relate to coding? Those would all be very common questions and you're about to learn the answer. Behind the mystique and scary sounding lingo, the principles behind OOP are the same as every other coding principle you will come across. Ultimately simple concepts when understood as a piece within a larger puzzle. And I think you're poised at this point to easily tackle the OOP piece of the puzzle, having come to understand everything we have covered so far. And actually, you probably didn't even realize it, but you've been doing OOP all along, because at the heart of OOP is a concept of separating your code into classes, which is what we've been doing with every script we've written thus far. But we've seen only one side of the two-sided coin, a coin which on one side has a class definition and on the other side, an object instance of that definition. So basically stated, when you're building a class, it's much like building a blueprint for an object that will be created later off of that blueprint. It's kind of like when we construct our instructions within our method definitions only to be executed later once the method is called. It's much the same in that you have a class definition, which is what we've been creating so far, that one side of the coin, that actually doesn't represent anything substantive until it is used to create an instance of it by creating an object in memory, which we'll get to exactly what that means in a moment. So yeah, we're going to expand on our simple understanding of classes as just simply labeled containers. They're labeled containers of information that describe the type of object you can create from it. Emphasis on type for reasons that you'll soon see. Let me give you a simple example to illustrate this relationship between a class and an instance. Think in your mind of any actual object that exists in, in the world, any object, a tree, a house, a person. These can all be described by the class that they belong to. A tree clearly belongs in a very different class from a person or a house, right? And within that class, or classification of that type of object in question is a description of its physical properties, which you can consider something like its fields, as well as what it does, or its behaviors and processes, which you can think of as its methods, its methods of achieving some end result, right? Uh, you know, a tree might have a method of growing, and while a human might have a method of growing too, but they'll be very different in those two different classes. The object class that we're most naturally in tune with, I would say, and have a strong intuition of is our own, the class we call human, right? And we can quickly call to mind common properties or fields, which every human has in common, though have unique values for in describing each actual human being object, as it were. So for example, we have things like gender, height, age, and so on. Those would be like the fields in the class human. And uh, the class definition, those fields and so on, will have to be broad so that it can refer to a range of actual human objects. So clearly humans share a lot of things in common, such as those, those traits, but we all have our own unique values in, our, in those fields and methods, as it were. So that's where the object instance comes into play. So the class represents the broadest possible definition and it remain, remains just a definition until you build from it an actual instance of an object of that class. So when you were born, you became a new instance of the class human from that partial class blueprint called DNA, right? So taking this analogy back to objects and code, how do we give birth to a new instance of a class in code, thereby making an actual instance of an object in memory? So this is the basic structure of creating a new object in memory. You have the, the class, you start with somewhere in your code, cl your class name, in other words, the name of your class, uh, some identifier, or you know, in other words, like any other variable name, and then you have the equal sign, the assignment operator, followed by the new keyword, 
new simply meaning a new object of this type, followed by yet again a reference to the class name with either empty or non-empty parentheses after it, and then we terminate it with the semicolon as usual. So as you can see, it's surprisingly easy to create an object or a class instance. But so far, all of our classes that we've been writing have had their object instances automatically handled and created by the Unity engine, owing to a somewhat technical fact that I don't really want to go into too much right now. But remember how I mentioned that the stuff you write in, in the update and start method definitions eventually get called somewhere off in Unity? Well, so too do we see this in effect, or should I say not see this in effect, with our object instances of the scripts we're creating. Simply stated, when we create a class that is also a mono behavior, right? this deals a bit with inheritance, which we won't go into just yet, but remember all the scripts we were writing, they, are, they have that reference to mono behavior. When we create a class that is a mono behavior, we're handing the instantiation of that class uh, as well as the calls to common methods to that class, like start and update, we're handing that off to the Unity engine to handle all that outside of our view. We actually don't see the process of, uh, of instantiation and calling those methods at work, but it is happening somewhere off in that vortex of the Unity engine, right? So examining those mono behavior scripts we've been writing won't really help you understand how this object model works. So what we're going to do is now create a brand new class. And unlike all of our previous classes that have been mono behaviors, we won't directly embed it into the Unity engine by making a mono behavior. And instead, we'll just have it not inherit from mono behavior. And we'll have uh, another script, which is a mono behavior, incorporate it. All right? You'll see what I mean in a second. So basically, this, this script, this class, will just be a pure C-sharp class. That way, we'll be able to better see how constructing classes and objects really works. So the first thing we're going to want to do is create a non-mono behavior script. So in other words, a script that doesn't derive from mono behavior. So in your test folder, let's create a new script and let's call it non mono behavior. And we'll open that up. And here we go. We'll we'll remove mono behavior, so it's not no longer inheriting from mono behavior. We're no longer handing the the job of instantiation and so on off to the Unity engine. So because it's not a mono behavior, we lose these uh, references to start and update. Don't they don't really have the same meaning they had before? Now let's do this. Actually, we'll call it instead of non non mono behavior. Um, I shouldn't have called it that, that's too, too broad. So actually we'll rename it to class to person. So I'll, I'll, I don't actually have to rename the C sharp script here, but I don't want to confuse you. Uh, so let's just call it person. Let's just keep it really simple. Now it's called person. We'll do the same thing. Call it person take out those references and we'll write some some uh, fields for our class person so string name all right so that's pretty common property string gender int age all right some simple as i said common properties well we'll save that class and now we need to create an object of it in another class so go back to unity and this time We'll make a new script, but this one will be a mono behavior because we want to output it to the Unity engine. So let's call it person factory. And before I forget, make sure you attach it to our game object so we can again see the output. So we'll want to see the output of person factory, attach it there and disable the other scripts. And let's write this in person factory. Right, because it is a mono behavior, we do make use of start and update, but we'll remove update, and we'll just simply make our 
object instance of our person class. So write this in, person, and then don't want to confuse you, but lowercase p person, this, could, this is our variable name, it could be anything, but I'm just um, using lowercase to show you that it's different. It, remember, it's case sensitive in C sharp, so it's different from the actual class name person with the uppercase p equals new person with empty parentheses and a semicolon on the end. Now the first thing, I'm not going to even run this because it's not really going to output anything of meaning to our to the Unity game engine. The first thing I want to note to you is that uh, now that we have a person, we have a person object off of that blueprint in, in our code, in our class person factory here. So normally what we would do to access the fields in that actual object would be to use the dot accessor. So person, lowercase p, is now a variable. Uh, so we, we reference it yet again just by typing it again. So uh, we hit the dot accessor and we notice that there's no fields. Where's gender, age, um, and so on. Name as well, right? Where are they? Well, we need to make the fields public so that they're publicly viewable in outside classes, not just viewable within this class called person. So just simply prefix all of these fields with public. No, definitely not that, public. And we'll save that. And now I'll type this out again. So let's establish our fields for our new person. So person, and then we hit the dot accessor. And there you see already our public fields are available to us. So the first one I'm going to uh, create a value for, for our unique person object is person name. And type whatever you want in. And then person gender. Again, whatever you want, as long as it's a string, and person age, there you go, I'm going to type in 26, Mario male 26, I'm not sure if you all know who I'm referencing, probably do, given that this is a game development course that you're looking at right now, and now we'll, we'll want to output this to Unity, so we'll access the debug log as we've become used to. And so first the name. And then the gender. Whatever order you want to do it in. It doesn't have to be the same order that you establish those fields. But we'll do it in the same order when we output. Name, gender, and age. All right, so we'll save that and show the output just so you can see what we're doing. There you go, Mario male 26. We are, we've got this person object and we've output its fields to the Unity engine.